innocence is this extraordinarily therapeutic opera about the need for honesty in the process of grief and honesty in the process of recovering from a trauma. So it's this incredibly beautiful exploration of the scars that we carry with us and the need to sometimes reopen wounds to make sure that we can heal them properly a second time around. And it's heartbreaking, very humanistic, has a very positive, loving message about humanity. Good afternoon, good evening. My name is Carol Gerstein, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to another seminar uh, of this forum, Carol Gerstein Invites. And uh, I'm beyond thrilled that we have uh, two guests today, two uh, incredibly creative people, the renowned composer, uh, Kaya Sariajo, and uh, Alexi Barrier, uh, who is a theater maker, uh, somebody that wears uh, many hats and will discuss um, the creative processes behind Alexi's works. And uh, of course, Kaya's compositions uh, do not need introduction. I must say on the personal note, I saw the, um, the opera, the new opera that premiered in X in the summer of this uh, year, Innocence, and it's a devastatingly powerful, beautiful and moving work that I know will be going to other opera houses. It's been like many things uh, delayed by the pandemic, but when you have a chance, see it. I think it's also on the Arte streaming platform and I cannot recommend this artistic experience enough. But we'll talk about um, Innocence, we'll talk about a, another new work of Kaya's, uh, Reconnaissance, uh, work of Kaya's and Alexi, and about their collaborative process. And as usual, you are most invited to uh, make comments, ask questions. This is a live format and very much depends on your live participation that's most welcome. And now, Kaya, Alexi, uh, I think you may be still on mute. And once you unmute yourself, then um, we're all together, gathered in this space. Good evening, and thank you for, thank you for being here, wherever here is. Good evening. Um, thank you for having us. Um, so um, let's um, launch straight into this. Um, should we talk first about innocence or about reconnaissance and then and then about things more more general? Perhaps let's talk about reconnaissance. Um, tell us about this uh, this new work and your um, interactions in it. Well, uh, this is a piece that was uh commissioned a few years ago and uh, we have been working on text together with Alexi on several occasions for my vocal music. This time uh, it was composed right after Innocence. So this idea of using multiple languages uh, in one piece was for me fresh and new experience. Uh, Alexi, on the contrary, is all the time working with multiple languages in, in his own work. And um, 
well, that's how it started. I, I asked whether he could write me a text and uh, then, uh, in fact, the concept of the piece came from him. I was uh, asking him, could we write something about Earth, our globe? And he said, uh, let's do it in a bigger sense and uh, let's uh, write also about Mars <laughs> and maybe he can tell about those ideas. Yes, well, tell us uh, a primitive but valid question. What is this piece about? One can ask that more so when the pieces are not uh, you know, absolute music without, uh, without text, but since this has a uh, dramaturgical uh, and linguistic content, what is this piece about? Well, what was really beautiful about the commission that was uh, started by the Accentus Choir was that it was really a carte blanche in the sense that it really, there was no, uh, no other parameters attached than the, using the choir. And so um, when we started thinking about what's, I mean, what the piece would be in general terms or in my story, story, storytellers' terms, what the what story would be telling? Um, it's uh, of course as we we as Kaya mentioned, we've done a few choir pieces together, but and there's always this background of to choir music. What story can you tell with a choir uh, that's specific to the format? That is not a story you can you would tell in a play or in a novel or in an opera. It's something very specific that has a beautiful tradition. And so I spent a lot of time when working on this in the fall of 2019. Um, also listening to the classics, listening to a lot of uh, Franco-Flemish madrigals. And uh, with Johannes Ockegem in my, in my years, suddenly when I saw this, high definition pictures of planet Mars that were uh, sent to us, literally sent to us by the Curiosity rover that had landed on Mars. And they have the juxtaposition of those two things. You have this music about the end of the world, and then you have uh, picture, uh, high, high resolution pictures of landscapes that where you can now very clearly see that they used to be rivers and they used to be seas. And it really looks like you have planet Earth, but only its skull, only its skeleton. It's a very chilling and uh, fr frightening vision. And so I uh, realized that there's something in common between these pictures and the music I was listening to, to between uh, these images from us as our possible future, um, both in the sense of our crazy dreams of wanting to go there and migrate there when we burn up this planet. And in terms of showing us what our planet will look like in a future that might be closer than we think. So uh, that's, there was this idea that uh, Madrigal is basically science fiction. So we might um, make a science fiction Madrigal about this subject. Fantastic. And what is, uh, just for people that don't know, what is the instrumentation? It's just choir, a cappella, or there is uh, there are uh, instruments that you use in addition? Well, I, I did, uh, they gave me the possibility or proposed that even in that sense, my hands would be free, that there could be electronic part or some uh, instruments. I've done music with voice and electronics quite a lot. So I thought what I have not done is uh, add some instruments to choir. So I chose to take a double bass and then a set of uh, percussion instruments for the piece. I so see. there are two musicians. And uh, so two musicians and a, and a choir and uh, 
then the text, uh, Alexei, do you uh, parse it? Is it in, in chapters? Is it, a, is it a suite of madrigals or is it a, is it a one chunk? And I know that you, you have uh, some sound examples and text examples that you will um, show, but just to understand a bit the, the shape of the piece. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, it is, uh, I mean, the structure comes from the idea of the madrigal and especially the requiem madrigals. But uh, this, what's beautiful about this form is the, the fluidity it uh, gives in terms of structure. Is that in a madrigal book, you have these small miniatures and they function together, they tell a story, but they still are each one very clearly defined uh, piece of, uh, of its own that tell, tells its own story in a way. So we have a, a five part piece here with an uh, interlude in the middle. And basically the beginning, the end and the middle tell us a narrative, a narrational story about uh, Mars from the first person that goes there to the last people left there and uh, in between at uh, the process of colonization. It's really science fiction in the most literal sense. And it was pre uh, pretty funny to have both the poetry of uh, this idea and uh, the highly unlikely idea that Kaya Sariaho would compose a science fiction story with words like fluorinated gases or um, manganese, and that she would find music for those words. Yes. But, Slight, like uh, put in between these uh, these episodes, we have shifts of perspective because that main idea was also that there's this big narrative about man as the conqueror, as explorer. This idea of reconnaissance in English, in English, um, but uh, that we need to undermine this with a series of other images, other stories. So we have some of the things that we'll hear uh, when we listen to the samples, like stories of people that are left on Earth, or stories uh, of this extract from uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's movie Solaris, which is, as a movie, a critique of uh, the space race, and it's the craziness of the ideas behind the space race, or um, something from the Hopi people, uh, the Native Americans who live in uh, present day in Arizona, and who have this narrative about um, the state of crisis of our civilization and how we need to deal with it before it brings a destruction of this world and our necessity to migrate to a new world. Uh, just by the way, a small uh, instrumentation question from uh, Tamar Muscal, a composer. She asks if the percussion part is for one player or multiple players, Kaya. It's for one player, and I try to be the selection of instruments uh, quite small, so there it's not very small. But uh, <laughs> but so there 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 is no vibraphone, or there are no there are not keyboards that take place because I I wanted to give them as if similar space, also spatially. But um, it's for one player with set of uh, mostly smaller instruments. Very interesting. And uh, you mentioned the word structure, Alexei. And of course, I assume the structure uh, of the narrative and of these uh, mini storylines um, is partly defining, but I think somewhere, and I might be able to pull it up somewhere on the internet, I saw a uh, fascinating page that said, this is a sketch uh, for the musical dramaturgy on the composition's timeline. And what I want to, I'll share that in a second, but I want to ask Kaya, well, generally uh, about your, feeling and perception of structure in, 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 in music composition, and in particular in this piece, and obviously that interjection of um, verbal narrative structure and how that meets with, uh, with the structure in the music. But let me show you, show everybody the, um, the page, if I, uh, I think there we, there we have it. Um, so, um, 
a lot of uh, a lot of writing uh, also uh, on this page. It's um, it looks quite uh, quite beautiful in itself. But can you talk a little bit about structure, Kaya? Structure of yeah. this piece. Well, uh, about the structure more most generally. This is how I start. Uh, this is something I I do draw for myself always before I start composing. And things uh, might change during the composition, but I, I think about the form that way. And, uh, and here, for example, the duration became longer and so on, but it's important for me. I, I imagine, for example, then when I did read uh, the texts by Alexi, um i i imagined already the music how how much time each passage would uh, what would be the duration so uh, if i'm working instrumental music uh, this uh, imagination of uh, need for some musical ideas comes of course differently here uh, it's completely clear that uh, more you have text, more you need time. But uh, but still, I wanted to have the general dramaturgy so that it would uh, it would work, uh, of course, musically first. But uh, that was not very difficult. Uh, these uh, uh, passages or movements are very different all of them. So I did imagine their tempi and their tempi relations. So this is kind of work that I do always before I start writing the actual music. I, I do imagine the music, but I, uh, I have a feelings and uh, the music has colors and so on, but I, I want it first be in my mind. I'm really afraid. Well, really, am I really? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm really afraid the fact that when I start composing, that it somehow vanishes, that the global color and smell of the music vanishes. So I first let it somehow get into my mind the totality. Then I create this, uh, this timeline, which for me is a very practical tool. It's, it's there on my working table. And then every day when I go to work, I, I see, oh, OK, here is, the, here is the paper. And today I'm going to dive in here. And uh, it somehow helps me to think about the totality then also, because composition is very, very long work. This is absolutely fascinating, this, um, this feeling of structure uh, and uh, how you go about it. So would it be correct to, um, to say that you um, let you feel a pre-sense the the totality of the composition before before you start and out of this uh, pre sense you make this sort of structural plan for yourself before you start writing notes is that do I understand correctly approximately something something like that but uh, well in in this case of course uh, it's slightly different because all the texts have very strong. Uh, character already and they give me but yes that's uh, that's how i work yeah no i'm very interested to quiet quiry you on the um generally on the on structure as a great composer and as a composer and for example this resonates to something that uh Oli nassen once told me that that for him as i asked him a similar question about structure uh he said that it was a practically a biological feeling of we'll have some music for a while like this and then there'll be some other kind of music for a while like this and he said that it was really um 
practically a physical, as I use the word, biological feeling. And I find that it's so good to hear you and Oli speak about that, because that's often not at all how um, structure is told, taught in theory to, uh, to music students, including performers, and that it's something much more um, uh, arithmetical and, and, and digital. But it's, it's wonderful to hear that it's such an organic um, feeling for you, it seems. It is organic, but I mean, there are numbers. I mean, th there are proportions, there are tempi and so on. But, uh, but the origin is quite uh, intuitive, yes. Wonderful. And then so, um, so then the text uh, started uh, meeting the music and perhaps uh, we can throw in here um, the multilingual uh, aspect that you also mentioned in the, uh, in the announcement um, text. Um, so what languages are you, are you working with here, Alexei? I think it's good that we hear the... Um... The second movement of the piece uh, of uh, reconnaissance right now, because it's in a way the most simple example uh, that we can discuss, or the most classic, let's say, because uh, this movement is um, it's a rocket launch uh, countdown, followed by a rocket launch, which uh, you can imagine Kaya had a lot of fun composing for a choir and two instruments, and it's uh, sort of. A, in, in a way that the madrigal can do, it compresses this human experience with a choir that's basically mankind uh, into a, a miniature that's just a few minutes. And so you have a countdown from 10 to one, which is in multiple languages, which is in the languages of uh, the space race, of the current space race. So you hear English, French, Russian, Chinese, and Arabic. The, this a very uh, clearly defined linguistic area as well. But then on, there's something else in between. There's the opposite, the uh, opposite choir of humankind, which is the other people. So there you have a bigger mix of language. You hear again English, as, but English as the language of the market and the, the, the language of uh, the capital. And, uh, and, other, and then some Spanish and then some African languages it, and some other stuff in that's uh, also in the mix. And it, it's a much uh, more uh, worrying thing because you hear this acceleration, you hear this uh, experience of as an accelerated society. And the language in this case is what, what allows us to do that. It get, allows us to have this motley experience already on a phonetic level of uh, everything that constitutes humankind and you'll see that the music in turn I wouldn't say it's messy but it's it gives an impression an impression of messiness of chaos and, well, and it, it is it's it in a way it is messy because yeah. you cannot understand everything uh, well you'll see with it now with uh, 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 let's, uh, I think I think um, this is uh, very enticing let's uh, let us please hear some okay let's hear some okay oh.
how bravi to to both of you and the performers. It's just um, first of all, it just it just sounds great. Um, and credit uh, to performers. Uh, this was the recorded to ten days ago by the um, in a live performance by the chamber choir, the Palau de la Musica Catalana in Barcelona, conducted by uh, uh, Simon Halsey, and the percussionist was. Uh, Nicole Vish and the double bass player Andreu San Juan. Wow, really fantastic and a privilege for us to be able to hear some of it uh, so soon after the after the performance. Um, one question comes to mind, Kaya. So um, here are um, all these languages that are um, thrown at you or put on your plate and um, how does this feel setting them to music? Because I assume uh, obviously each language has its own rhythm and provokes certain responses from you as a composer, doesn't it? It does. And, uh, and again, well, uh, for very long time, I've used, I've used separately different languages and that really awoke my interest to see what happens if I use them together because every language is inviting different kind of music and different kind of ideas. Well, here everything goes by so quickly that uh, there was no, not really concentrating concentration on that aspect that is much more present in Innocence Opera, of course, where people uh, speak different, their own native languages. But, uh, and one, one funny thing is also that uh, until recently, I never composed music uh, with language that I don't speak myself. I, uh, and, but here I'm thinking about more lyrical or, you know, uh, something that how could I have a, I felt that I need to have a feeling about uh, experience of every word, but uh, word, but here it's in fact completely opposite. I'm, ve I'm very much using things also as uh, because of of their sound and this I've done now a little bit recently and uh, people often tell me that Finnish is very beautiful language so I asked myself how could I hear it for six uh, seconds without understanding any of it so so there is this purely sonic approach now also so in some way, uh, in such a context, uh, the words themselves become music because it's a sonic experience rather than intended for uh, actual verbal comprehension, no? That too, yes. Well, it's, it, I mean, but this is our world today. This is what we hear also. We hear all these languages around us. And I must say that the particularly this text was uh, specific because Alexi wrote two chapters next to each other. But we never discussed uh, really how I would compose them. But uh, for me, it was self-evident that I, they needed to be together. I see. And um, does uh, this piece uh, acquire um, sort of connection, musical connections for you and musical elements that you keep reusing as sort of signatures of different things throughout the piece, or you chose not to construct it this way in, uh, uh, in this composition? There are connections. There are connections. Uh... Uh, well, first and uh, last movement have clear musical connections. Otherwise, there is a general material. There is a, 
there are harmonic ideas and so on. But uh, yeah, well, in that sense, it's like any piece. It, uh, it needs to be coherent, even if the uh, different movements are quite different. I mean, have very different character. Yeah. Uh, speaking about this, so I cannot help and question you about so the structure. You've given a very uh, fascinating and private insight. Uh, how do you, this? so you say harmony, obviously we live uh, in, a, in a world where, well, in our lives generally, harmony has transformed its meaning and certainly in Western classical music, there's been an ongoing transformation of uh, the idea of the harmonic language. And I had this feeling, for example, listening to Innocence, that my ear uh, couldn't necessarily, so in real time, discern some um, connection that I could verbalize and the logic that, that I could verbalize, yet it really, your language is so convincing in that the next note that comes is the note that um, that should come, that one wants to have uh, come. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about harmony and uh, how you think about it nowadays? I don't think it has changed very much uh, the way I think about it. Uh, but opera is always a specific case for me. And um, innocence is really the most uh, complex thing I've ever composed. And uh, because all of my operas, the persons, the characters, they have their own music. And this own music uh, includes uh, their own material for creating the, the, the singing part, if there is singing, uh, their own harmony. And uh, then depending of the connections of persons here in innocence, for example, there is mother and girl, daughter, so their harmonies have uh, meeting points. And then, um, then everybody has their own instrumentation also. When I write an opera, I imagine that uh, when person walks in, he or she is also that music. That's how I, I, I work in opera space. Um, so I hope there is a logic. And uh, similarly, often in, in one piece, there is a, I don't use do tonal functions and uh, I avoid them in fact, uh, but uh, every, every piece have a kind of uh, basic space, uh, which could be like uh, the basic chord. And depending of the context, it can be complex. It can be, for example, many harmonies uh, with each other's, or then it can be something very simple on the contrary. So there are, uh, I'm thinking very much about uh, psychoacoustic uh, ways of listening and uh, marking our memory. So there need to be clear, clear things uh, musically that I mark listener's memory. Um, concerning still innocence, uh, what was challenging for me that I did have 13 persons. Uh, in my operas until now, I had uh, mostly four main characters. And uh, here uh, we worked a, a lot about these languages and all that with Alexi. And uh, uh, then 
I said, well, I don't know how can I write 13 different musics so that they are audibly different enough. And then uh, Alexi said, but why don't you, do they all need to be singers? You never brought actors on the stage. And uh, that gives you different ways, possibilities to use the voice. And then that's what I, in fact, ended doing. That was like evident for him, but for me, completely new thing. I had never done it. So I, uh, so there are spoken roles, differently spoken roles. And uh, sometimes like the Spanish language, I, uh, I used only the rhythm and the, uh, of the spoken lines and uh, there are no pitches at all. And so um, to say, so this is very fascinating with sort of these uh, psychoacoustic markers and, uh, and certain recurring things that, that help orient the, the ear. But would you say, therefore, um, that in each piece you essentially come up with whatever system that will replace the tonal harmonic relationships that you that you avoid or do you find that rather you have let's say an overarching harmonic um, I won't say system but certain uh, trends uh, and preferences that you uh, have as a more continuous thread in your work I define it every time uh for a specific piece. But uh, of course, there are things that I like more or less and, I, and the material can recycle. And I need to correct myself. I use the word aiming, that I'm aiming tonal harmony. A long time, I not, not aiming, but what did I say? Avoid. Avoiding, yeah. Because I, uh, I was raised uh, as a composer in an era where we had to avoid absolutely everything. We had to avoid octaves, we had to avoid uh, the steady beat, and, uh, and uh, we had to avoid also tonal harmony uh, with the teachers, which I... Uh, studied with, but I did decide that I stop avoiding because it's, it's, it's a negative way to go into music. And uh, so that was long ago, but still I don't uh, write now triads because I'm trying to avoid them. I don't, I write tri. I don't try triads because I have my own harmony. And I think it's very important that everybody have their own harmonic language because it's like a smell. It's, it comes right away. Uh, you hear Debussy for five seconds and you know that's Debussy. Why? You have heard nothing else yet but the harmony. So I, it's very important musical parameter but it needs to come from you and that I have been teaching myself to do over these 40 years <laughs> and more. And certainly your music has uh, that um, instantly perceptible um, flavor and uh, and presence, but I'm curious for, for a second, uh, since you've gone in that direction, a historical detours, why, um, what is your um, thought or theory on the fact that um, that generation of composers, uh, particularly early post-war generation composers had this aesthetic that these things had to be avoided, the triads, the octaves, the steady, uh, steady rhythm, and obviously this has been quite a um, a rift in the twentieth century. Where, where, what do you think are the origins of it for you, and in your opinion? 
I think it was the historical situation. I um, something new had to be born, and then uh, the the fact that it came so extreme after the war. I I don't know. You know, pandemic is traumatizing for all of us, but think uh, how war was. I don't know. I see it in that kind of point of view very much. So you feel that uh, one had to do away with the old world order and and told no harmony in some way was very much of the of the old world. I don't order. think only about the tonality. I'm, I'm really thinking about the organization. I, I don't know, I'm completely wrong. And this is maybe a horrible thing to share with the big public uh, or small public or anybody else. But um, I had a feeling that uh, the traumatized uh, mind needed to get order, things to order. And, uh, and we wanted to intellectualize things as much as we were able to. I don't no. know, Alex, do you have something to it say? Sounds, it, sounds, no, it sounds very convincing. What do you think, Alexi? As, a, as they say, uh, the, you know, the title of the Edward Steuermann's uh, uh, autobiography is the not so innocent bystander. So, <laughs> so what do you say as the not innocent collaborator? Well, it's a, there's a generational shift here, so I cannot speak of exactly the same things. I was born uh, one week after the uh, Berlin Wall fell. So um, I grew up in a world where, you know, they've, there was not much to fight for. So I think, and I think the perspective on that is very different. It's much more relativistic. And uh, what I see in composers of my generation is very different, of course. Uh, I mean, apart from perhaps a few little pockets of uh, dogma in some neighborhoods in Paris or in uh, Berlin, I think uh, younger composers have a much freer approach. Uh, to uh, to how things can be combined uh, to how to cross uh, boundaries and borders in terms of uh, style in terms of influences um so uh, sure that this something about what the world you are describing has been processed uh, definitely and i think we we're now approaching it very differently and I, i'm sure there would also be a lot to say about this in terms of language if we were to uh, Come, come back to that uh, area or to uh, use it as a comparison point. Absolutely. Um, so uh, you didn't yet tell us, so well, we told us about the countdown part of the, of the piece, uh, just to uh, help everyone orient themselves. What are the other um, chapters of this, um, of, of, uh, of reconnaissance that well, come back, we, could hear the, we could hear the interlude that comes right after this uh, countdown, which is in total contrast to it. But the, the countdown, as you saw, is really this chaotic uh, babel of languages. And I think it also has a very uh, close connection to more classic forms of uh, multilingualism, so that, let's, that, such as, you know, a wrong by Berio or other pieces from that era where multilingualism was usually used in terms of quotations. It, uh, the fact of having multiple languages allows to show that this, these are different sources and that we are combining them and still creating a texture out of the multiplicity rather than trying to make a unified whole. But now in the, in the interlude, we, we have this little Tarkovsky moment and the way to handle multilingualism is very different and I think maybe more hopeful because it is about original and translation. Would you like yes, to hear? Let's, yes, please, absolutely. And I must say that we're very lucky to have this performance recorded. It was recorded by the Finnish uh, company Teatro, uh, who recorded it for a documentary about Kaya's music. And it's a great recording of a great performance. Here it comes.
Very different, uh, very different indeed. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Kaya, sort of, uh, in the, in association, since you talked about multilingualism and using many languages uh, here, um, as you are writing music with these uh, many different languages, is it also pulling you in the directions of? Uh, quotations. Also, Alexi said in the beginning that he was listening to Okegem's uh, music. These um, suggestions do they uh, do they run interference with uh, with 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 your um, making music, or do, do they implant themselves into into your uh, music composing, or rather, you stay the course? I don't. I don't think about other musics when I compose, if, if that's what you mean. Uh, but uh, for example, uh, well, uh, here, it seems to me very normal to have a bass voice to sing this. And of course, that little bit uh, points to the idea of uh, Russian bass, which uh, I, I like very much singing. Uh, and then uh, I don't know what it has to do with the film of Solaris, which is really one of my favorite films. and I love Tarkovsky and I, by the way, love his uh, father's poetry also very much. So, uh, yeah, the triggers association is one of the reasons why I asked indeed. So pardon my, you know, cliched ear, but of course, when one hears the Russian text and this base, then somehow one is so, uh, it, it triggers these things and one immediately does think so some, you know, some Hovanshina uh, or Godunov moment and which I mean uh, positively, but it's interesting how, um, well, in fact, the language and the combination of language and sound triggers also kind of stylistic and geograph music geographical uh, associations. And, sure. Um, Sure. Um, so um, uh, there was a actually a question that I can ask, or a couple of questions I can ask along the way from our participants, Yulia Sevikovska, a music journalist. She asked, dear Kaya, do you show your work to your collaborators or to anyone before it is finished? Are there milestones on that scheme by which you know yourself when it is half finished or nearly finished? Or is it more spontaneous and cha chaotic? Thank you, Yulia. Nothing in my composition is uh, chaotic, but uh, but uh, I no, I never show my music to anybody. I mean, uh, before it's ready. Even Alexi in this case didn't see what was happening. Uh, Alexi has seen things, but uh, but not this piece. Well, when I signed Innocence uh, score at the country house uh, where I was alone. I called, uh, I had been working on it for three years and uh, I called Alexi and, uh, and, uh, and made uh, with my phone the, uh, the uh, you know, the, how do you call it, FaceTime. Uh, yeah. When I signed the score, I, I wanted somebody to be there with me. And uh, at that time, uh, uh, in the house, there was nobody and he was somewhere else. So that was, uh, for me, important moment. <laughs> but uh, no, I don't really like, I, I really cannot verbalize about my music when I'm comp composing. I... It's, it's kind of, again, it's about this thing that uh, I would be scared that something disappears. Mm. So you don't play also excerpts of it for your, for your husband or for Alexei? Oh, nightmare. No, oh, no question. No, it's very much my completely private. Uh, yeah. 
space. Yes, it's a uh, it's yes. Uh, yes, it's just that I think it's it's also about different phases of the process in the same way that of course I I, I mean there's a phase where I wouldn't share the process, but then at some point it's part of the process that it becomes as an object of discussion or performance between people and like we, I said I didn't see a single bar of uh, reconnaissance at that and during the composition phase but in the phase right after that when we uh, went through the score and when the musicians went through the score I mean that's a much more collaborative phase and I think it still belongs to the composition process the composition doesn't end with the double bar so but mm. and, and a few days ago we were still correcting some things in the score after the after the performances that happened in the fall and uh, I think they're very interesting and highly important compositional stakes like one thing is of course clarity of notation um, when you when once you had the crash test of sending the score not talking to anyone and then you go to the first rehearsal then of course you realize that all other things being equal, of course, some things are about how clear the notation was. And the piece get, get, gets better also in terms of notation because we learn from what happens in rehearsals. And even from a more compositional point of view, there are things we hear, realize that don't work. So we might change a word or change uh, something in the dynamics or do even do bigger changes. So I think that in that sense, uh, you do share. That's yeah. true, of course. Then I'm very open. Then I'm very open when, when the first version is on paper. That's true. And we did change many things of the language and, and so on. Uh, that's true. But as long as the piece is only in my mind, I, I don't dare to share it. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of non-composers don't uh, realize what an incredibly private and I would venture to say lonely uh, road comp composing is because finally you make something that's indeed very, very public and very much shared with the public. So there is this um, uh, direction and or vector towards towards the public, but on the other hand, it's um, for a long time until, as you said, the score is signed. It seems to be such a private and I guess lonely uh, long road because, like you said, it takes it takes several years for many pieces to um, to appear. How long was the composition process for reconnaissance? You said innocence was three years. I don't know because you know after COVID I lost my sense. Yeah, yeah, we all don't know anymore. Yes, yeah, I. Yeah, I don't know. I everything was cancelled, uh, but something which was very heavy then when everything was postponed and this concerns of course of everybody is that uh, I carried all the music in my mind because it, it was not yet public and was, uh, what Alexis said, the, the collaboration really actively starts then when we are in the rehearsal and we start hearing the music and then only then little by little I can get rid of it. And uh, here I was carrying this uh, uh, really heavy innocence i was carrying the choir piece i was carrying my my big vista so this uh, yeah but i think in interestingly this was composed mostly during the first lockdown right i think it was in finland yes <laughs> yes yeah by the way, just yesterday, re relating to, uh, it's not completely parallel to what we're discussing, but relating to the loneliness in the composer, I stumbled on a phrase by a quote by Theodore Adorno, who said, polyphonic music says we, even if it lives uniquely in the imagination of the composer without ever reaching another living person. And I found it so somehow touching. Well, Come on, it sounds a little bit uh, depressing. <laughs> we anyway well, we are 
It depends on how you look at it, but I think I think this uh, the reaching out towards the we is uh, I find it very moving and very humanistic. But you could say uh, if it just stays in the imagination of the composer, uh, then it's depressing. But luckily, not the not the case uh, with the pieces we are. Um, discussing. Um, I'm wondering, uh, well, actually, before anything, there's also a question, a relevant uh, question to the discussion uh, about the choral piece by uh, your compatriot, the uh, wonderful uh, journalist Yari Kallio, uh, who says, uh, Dear Kai and Alexei, how do you differentiate between the different roles assigned to the singers within the chorus? Is it special spatial placement of the singers? Is it tempi, texture, color, melodical contour? Thank you. So, um, is in fact this is an excellent question. Uh, the spacing of the choir is that something that um, has a role here, or or it's a very traditional sort of choir positioning? We didn't get so far. The piece was just premiered, and uh, and it had to be done uh, as uh, as as the choirs were used to sing. Or uh, already it was a little bit complicated to space the the percussions so that they wouldn't mask the singers and so on. I I feel that a lot of things could be done with this piece which would be more effective and so on, but that will happen in the future. I mean, one thing we can say is that I mean, the oppositions that were built into the text, we did discuss those during the uh, process and about how to cast them and to make the best use of this idea that you have in a choir, that a choir can suddenly be two opposing groups or multiple opposing groups and that an individual can come out and that all of that, since it was scripted in the text, we did discuss about uh, how to how to cast them, and about the interlude we just heard. We did discuss the fact that uh, soprano and bass would be on the opposite, would probably be on not only uh, acoustically opposite but physically opposite in the choir, and that it would be it would uh, create a sort of balance and contrast in that sense as well. That's true. Yeah. Okay. If that's casting, yes. I, <laughs> I, I, I would. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking in more musical terms, in a way. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would have been. Uh, it could have been possible to do it with two tenors, and it would have been a very different uh, music. You know, sure. Effect. But for me, uh, it's like a musical uh, decision. And where do we go after the interlude? What 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 happens in the piece? What happens in the narrative? And is there coming another, um, so let's say, cam camera angle to uh, to the musical and the dramatic situation? Well, uh, in terms of what we are going to listen to, we'll skip the next part, which is the uh, the science fiction fantasy of how we need to rebuild an atmosphere of planet Mars, and we only we happen to be the best people to do that because we need uh, to create greenhouse gases to rebuild the atmosphere. And as we are the international experts or the universal experts of uh, uh, creating greenhouse gases and uh, warming a planet, we do that same job on, on planet. Mars. It's a it's a, a sort of satiristic uh, movement uh, that has also a lot of humor in it. But uh, if we want to listen to another bit, I suggest we listen to the movement right after that, which involves another language again, and a language that hasn't been often set to music in uh, the Western tradition, because it's a language of the Hopi people. Yes, let us please hear that. Here we go.
So that's also why I thought it's so wonderful that it was a, such a great choice not to use electronics because it would have been really expected in the more technological parts. Whereas here we, we have the same instruments uh, that are being used to this, to recreate very technologically uh, complex sounds or expected sounds and uh, and it's linked to a very different culture that has its own use of instruments and of the rhythm and of voice and using the same uh, instruments to create very different colors really brings very different uh, coloration to the whole piece absolutely well and and the choir the the human voice uh, naturally makes it so um so moving because we've, because it's so um powerful for the for the ear i think even more so than instruments but the, since you mentioned electronics and of course we all know kaya that you um, composed very prominently for combinations using electronics but in the recent years would it be would it be accurate to say that you've uh, gravitated away from the uh, electronics or do you do you feel you uh, may still return to the electronics where are you in electronics today oh i'm using electronics uh, i i use them um, in a large scale in my previous opera only the sound remains uh, in a new way uh, i I'm really interested in electronics, but uh, it's very painful tool because it is uh, the all the verses are upgraded all the time and so on. You know, I wrote the uh, uh, cello piece in eighty uh, eight, and uh, nobody had to revise anything except a couple of uh, wrong notes there. Uh, that I have uh, were misprinted, but the electronics of my music that I've uh, written in the 80s, it's uh, soon, I've written so much music that uh, we should have like a, a little uh, workshop where people are all the time revising them. So I'm, I do use electronics when I feel that there will be a good use for them. I, I still like doing it, but uh, it really depends on project. I see. But in Innocence and in this piece, uh, this is so entirely acoustic, or was there something electronic in Innocence also? Oh, it cannot be really called electronics. It's just that the, the, some spoken voices are amplified. Yeah, naturally. Um, I wonder, Alexi, uh, should we speak, and Kaya, should we speak a bit about uh, innocence as well, or would you prefer to stay on reconnaissance, because both are uh, deserving, I think, so seminars of their own, but of course, innocence, as I said to you, was such a strong, uh, strong impression as a listener, I can say. But would you so prefer? So sure it, it would be perhaps nice to speak also about innocence a little bit and i think it's also linked very directly because uh, there is almost like a choir effect in innocence because again it has 13 characters that all have their own specific language um tell a little bit uh, because not everybody possibly will know the um well the story and a bit the background of the of the opera before we get into the particulars sure uh, well, well, uh, should i should do you want to tell the story uh, do it but very shortly of course uh, <laughs> short is my <laughs> name um that well the um, it what this is uh what's, what's very special about this opera is also it's that it's on a based on a it's an original story and an original libretto written by Finnish novelist uh, Sophie Oxanen, who wrote the libretto in Finnish about a story, something that happens in Finland, which is a traumatic event in a high school. And uh, 10 years later, people involved in it uh, who end up being in the same space because of a marriage, of a wedding. And um, 
So we have different from different people from different backgrounds who in those two moments, those two timelines between which we switch are um, interacting with each other and uh, it's conceived as a fresco originally. Uh, that was the first idea Kaya had for the project was to make it a fresco of multiple characters that all have singular voices, but also function as one integrated whole. So it has similarities with the, with the idea of the choir. Although the choir, as we use it in Reconnaissance, is more universal. It's more about the Greek choir and the collective situation of these people on the planet. Uh, innocence is more of a psychological drama between 13 people. Um, do you want to add something, Kaya, or? No, well, that's it. And uh, I, I did have this uh, desire to use many, many different languages in this context. And uh, that's why it has to do with the subject matter that it happens in international school. And there would be children and uh, teachers coming from different nationalities. So that seemed like a, uh, like a natural way to integrate the languages. And uh, then when Sophie had uh, advanced with the libretto, uh, we started discussing the languages with Alexi. And uh, there are some languages that I don't speak so but I agree to use. There is even one language I don't even read because it's the Greek language. So, um, so then, um, you know, we found different kind of solutions like uh, rather Alex did. It was, became his job to record people, native people reading the text. Uh, well, of course, some, uh, singers, uh, Magdalena Kocheva, uh, who is singing also in Czech. She was uh, also reading the text for me and so on. This is fascinating. And uh, I can't resist uh, uh, asking about the, uh, the uh, role and uh, the part of the uh, young woman that that sings in in Finnish in this sort of uh, stratospheric and non-classical, uh, non-traditional sounding voice, which was incredibly striking and and beautiful and really in my listener's memory part of the sort of the signature of the piece. Can you talk about uh, uh, about this part, please? Yes, Vilma. Vil the singer's name is Vilma Yeah. She, um, at some point then when uh, I decided to open the palette uh, for different kind of use of voice, uh, I became to think about uh, Finnish folkloric ways of singing. I have uh, memories from my childhood when my, uh, uh, may, when my, grandmother was milking the cows and uh, when I like to go early in the morning there with her and the cows were wandering freely so she had this special way of calling them it needs to be of course very strong so that the cows heard, heard her and came so maybe that maybe other Things like that. Uh, I, uh, my family comes from Karelia, so I had been already interested in, uh, I don't know, how do you call it, itkuvirsi, uh, the weeping uh, singing and uh, other techniques. And um, so I wanted to find a young girl. And uh, there is a department at the Sibelius Academy uh, of. Uh, of the uh, of the folk music and uh, 
I had been already worked in my previous opera with uh, our traditional instrument called Kantele. And uh, so I knew Eija, her name is Eija Kankanranta. And uh, then I asked Eija, well, can you help me? How could I find someone? And uh, she discussed with her colleagues and, and so on, because on the internet, I didn't find really. I mean, there were there are some famous groups, but I needed a young girl. And uh, well, that's why then um, Vilma was found. And it's many years ago. She was only doing her, how do you call it, the basic degree. The basic degree. Yeah. And uh, I, I first I um, I just I was in contact with her from Paris and I said, could you, uh, you there's no material, could you go to can you sing me something? Uh, I I would like to hear your voice better. And then she went down to the. Helsinki Music Hall garage because he she liked the acoustics and and uh, she sang their different ways of using her voice. Uh, they, I mean, they don't have continuous voice, these singers, or and everybody has different kinds of voices. And so she had this very strong uh, uh, low register. Then she had. Uh, couple of uh, really high spots, uh, which have to do with this technique exactly to call it cows. And then, um, well, she has basically three ca different kind of uh, techniques at that time. It's now many years ago. And then uh, uh, I had already written some music then when, I found her and we tried things out and then we really collaborated. And of course, over these years, she has now made her master's degree. So she has developed as a, as a singer and she's very, very, very special girl. Young woman, I would say. Yeah, this, uh, it really is. Uh, I wish we had some examples, but again, I encourage everybody to uh, register on the Arte platform and, and watch the, um, the stream because uh, it's hard to describe, but it's incredibly beautiful and um, haunting. But so the material you wrote for her, though, is say some transformation working through your uh, childhood uh, memories, but, but you're not in fact using uh, folk material there. It's composed. There's no folk music at all. They are, there are, uh, it's my attempt because in this story, she is doing her own songs and uh, mock songs and so on. So it's my attempt to, to be this girl and make the mock songs. So there's no folk material and not even, I mean, this cow thing, what do I really remember? It, it was just, I remember that there were these kind of shouts, uh, they have their own, uh, own naming, uh, which go very high. Fascinating. And a uh, silly practical question. Is it now a role that can only, only be sung by, by Vilma or by this lady? Or uh, do you see it somehow um, uh, possible for another performer and perhaps even a non-Finnish performer? And now we get to a so multilingualism uh, point again. Is this, is this transposable to another person or is this really only possible with this, uh, with, uh, this artist? It has to be transposable at some point. Now we have Vilma. Life goes on. There will be someday somebody else. That's how opera works because it's, uh, it's, the, it's planned so much ahead. And uh, every singer's voice are, are changing. When I composed La Muda Luan, my first opera now more than 20 years ago, 
I could not imagine anybody else than Dawn Upshaw singing uh, the role of Clemence. I, I just couldn't, I thought, well, it just, it's not possible. Well, now many, many people are singing it. And uh, this goes even for instrumentalists. When I wrote, write for instrumentalists, I write, write for those persons and something I feel their personality inspire me. But then, then the pieces start living their lives. That's, that's very interesting. And you feel uh, that once you've released the piece into, uh, into the co common communal space, you feel that, um, mm, how do you feel about letting it go in the sense that also perhaps comes a conductor, a performer, interpreter that um, plays it with a different accent so to say let's say using a, a linguistic analogy do you feel that it's important for you to insist as a composer is it important to insist as a composer or then it's no longer your own so to say and it has its own life and interaction the composition uh, i cannot assist everything that's for sure that my music is uh, interpreted differently uh, from previous or for the first one that's no problem at all if it if there is an interpretation but then there is a big problem which is that people there are people who don't understand this music and still want to perform it for one reason or another and um, and that is a big problem for me, but I try to ignore it because uh, if I can, if I can not uh, choose the performers, what can I do? I mean, I cannot say, oh, my music can be performed only by these and these people. It's not possible. So. Uh, well, some of your colleagues have tried that approach, as you know, but. Uh, really? I think there are uh, some, and I think there are some specific pieces that I know even Mr. Kurtak's one of his pieces that only so particular two people can 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 play it. Oh yeah, well, well he, it's his approach. We are in that sense very different. I know that he, he works very much in detail with musicians before the concert, but also after the concert. So I, I want to, if, if there is a musician who has a feeling and understanding about my music, I'm very happy to let them to go and discover it in, in their way. This is uh, this gets us in some way to a subject of uh, of uh, notation also, and we've had some seminars in this series where you know great uh, uh, length and and uh, detail the notation of uh, really old music is discussed, or even so what did Brahms uh, uh, mean? Certainly in the classical period, there's much discussion. What's your feeling? Um, how exactly can one notate? How exactly can you notate? And how exactly does one want to notate? Because you see also there are composers that um, have been so obsessive about writing down the interpretation and crowding it with all sorts of um, additional explanations. But where is your, where is your feeling on this um, gray area of... Um, exactitude versus uh, interpretive uh, room. I would like to notate uh, all I imagine, but, and sometimes the notation can look quite complicated, but uh, I don't put there anything that isn't needed, but as you know, our classical notation, our uh, 
inherited notation uh, unless music doesn't have a, still its own tradition i mean anything can happen it's for it's finally very wide uh, of many possibilities i i never try to be too complex with my my notation but there are really some things that i i need to put there otherwise uh, i didn't it's not as i imagined it cannot be as a, as i imagine um, it's it's a big question and uh, and i know that uh, there are many aspects uh, of using the voice for example that certainly are not uh, notated as uh, exactly as possible or then one one thing i i want to use very much i i use the terminology to to characterize the music um, normally i do it in uh, in uh, italia vocabulary because for me that's part of the voc notation but then for example in innocence we started doing it in english and also otherwise my um, yeah for the for the roles in the operas i do it in english more often and uh, now what i we are still working with alexi with record is uh, all these languages uh, how to pronounce them and where to put where to notate that exactly so that it doesn't become uh, really complicated yes and uh alexi so uh it, in uh, innocence uh, your role uh is a bit different than in, in reconnaissance so there you are the lib librettist in, in reconnaissance in innocence um tell 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 us more about your roles and i think one of the roles was being a translator and then we get uh, also to in some way notation and the possibility of um, conveying something notated and translating it yeah well it was a uh, that was let's say at the end of the process this the the first uh, discussion we had with kaya and sophie about what the opera could be was in uh, march 2013 so uh, now we're uh, some while ago, and we were, I, my, I was brought in as a dramaturg because uh, Sophie was writing her first uh, libretto. And also there was this idea of um, how, what, what are the possibilities of the form of uh, opera or music theater. Uh, it was about opening doors that she maybe didn't know were there. And it was the same with Kaya, also in terms of what she mentioned earlier, for instance, uh, having actors on the stage instead of singers for some parts. And, uh, but because from the first discussions, there was also this idea that it would be multilingual um, and that Sophie would write in Finnish only, it became part of my job also to create the composed version of the libretto. Uh, and uh, which is a very strange role because you're not ex exactly a librettist. You're not writing the original text, but on the other hand, there's in the final libretto, there's like 4% 4, 4 of the Finnish libretto left in terms of the words that are being spoken. So it was actually creating the text that Kaya would compose. And as Kaya said, it sometimes that always involved uh, giving her all the material in a way that she could use it as a material and. Uh, compose out of it so it was uh sometimes doing the translations myself or sometimes uh doing them uh, with other people and sometimes asking someone to do them and recording them also uh, speaking the texts but that was only part of the translation process because in the end we ended up making a lot of changes again in the rehearsal room with one of the beauties of the piece is that you want might want to cast uh, native speakers in some of the roles. So 
whatever you're doing this opera, you will necessarily have people from all sorts of backgrounds and uh, cultures. And it's very, and it's an interesting situation in and for itself. So we've been making corrections to the text with multiple people. There's not one person who's responsible for 100% of the text in any given language. And there are nine languages in the opera. So that, that's, uh, so yes, it's, I was a translator, but I think in a very specific, weird, very weird, unusual sense, because it was a collective effort. So I was a mediator in the role of the translator. It's very yeah. fascinating that, like you said, uh, so, and you are very true to your noble mission that you discuss in the, in the announcement text that um, practically these two pieces as examples really, um, in the best sense, force uh, multilingualism and, and multiculturalism and a certain, uh, well, organized and harmonic coexistence that as you say one has to one is going to uh, need a non uh, homogeneous cast of, uh, of, 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 of characters and um, but I guess uh, would it be accurate to say that this is part of also your experience of growing up uh, multiculturally? Uh, you said you're born in in France. Your mother language is uh, is is Finnish. Your English is incredible. Can you talk? Can you talk about your personal feeling of um, being a multilingual, multicultural person? Well, it's a uh... I mean, yes, I have that background, and, but but I think it's increasingly uh, common. But it's not only co it's common in very different contexts. What was also interesting in the plot of Innocence is that you have people in this uh, in this international school in Helsinki, and some of them obviously, like in such places, you have people who are multilingual because they come from upper class families, and people who are multilingual because they come from other kind of minorities. And that's, uh, that's always a very different discussion, the kind of multiculturalism that is created by different social situations. And, um, but it is something that can, to which both uh, backgrounds, people from both backgrounds can relate. And that's also something very interesting is that we, it creates a space where everyone is just as confused about what language they were dreaming in or uh, what is the language that they return to when they go into themselves, for instance, to deal with trauma, or what is the common language that we have? We have those shifts all the time in the opera as well, but what language are we speaking together? Although English is mostly used as the vehicle language. But it was very intimate also uh, in relationship to the background because by definition, since I was supposed to take care of the translations, we chose languages that I either know very well or that I had been dealing with to some extent and uh, so the fact that the, the, the bridegroom in the wedding is, uh, has one uh, Finnish parent and one uh, French parent, and that the communication language is English, is, I mean, it's almost an autobiographical thing for me that somehow true the translation came into the, the opera. And um, so, and I think it's, it's you would you could think of the translation as being something very functional because we all do it now we all use google translate it's automatic automatic in a lot of places and a lot of contexts but it's actually very language and translation the process of translation of extremely uh intimate things are extreme uh, they're rooting things into childhood into uh internal monologues into things that are extremely private and so I think it's beautiful that it, this also is shown in this opera in that way, that it is um, languages are something both political and intimate. And that's how I feel I relate to it, first from my background and trying to make that into a topic, making it into the sub a subject, even if just through the translations and the many languages. Because they never, they never talk about it in the in the opera. They never mention that they have their own languages and that there are differences into how you say this in this language or uh, in another. It's never mentioned, but it's always there. It's like the word mafia in the Godfather. Uh, tell me, um, 
when you feel yourself, uh, do you feel yourself French? Do you feel yourself Finnish? Does this change depending on the situation? You dismiss these uh, categories as mundane? Because I'm very interested f- for uh, various reasons. You know, myself, I've uh, so grown up in Russia, but left when I was 14 uh, to America, then to Europe. My children grow up in uh, in Berlin in a very multicultural, but possibly disoriented sense, and I don't know what they will feel themselves as. But I'm curious with you, uh, where do you where do you feel yourself? Well, I think it's a very tricky question. Um, Naturally, sure. that's why I asked it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I won't be perverse and ask you to go first and answer, but it's um, I think. We, it's um, it's very com- identity is very complex and is composed of a lot of things, not just nations or whatever you put behind nations. I mean, I've, I would say that I have a stronger relationship to the French language and the Finnish language than to the, any idea of France or Finland because that's how those feelings are being mediated to me. And um, the langu- those languages is what I had to struggle with when I'm trying to formulate an idea or to get something across to someone. That's uh, in a way what matters to me most, the language, the languages. But um, of course, I'm, um, in a, I'm belong to, count- to different countries and to different cultures, but also different social classes. and. Uh, uh, all those things are ingrained in me, whether I want them or not. And it's usually when I don't, I'm not trying to feel them, but I feel them. You know, it's when you're thinking you are a cosmopolitan uh, intellectual and then you bump into someone and you have a very specific stand about a specific thing. And then, oh, that's so French. Oh, that's so Finnish. You think you are outside of all of it, that you are above uh, distinctions. And then, of course, you are stereotyped. And of course, if you are truly influenced by your cultural background. So uh, my, and my honest response or answer would be that I wouldn't want to feel this or that, but I am made to feel this or that uh, because of uh, my background and who I am. And that's, that is fair. Yeah, no, I uh, I agree with you, uh, with uh, especially with with language, and comes to mind. Uh, you know, there was this uh, Romanian poet, uh, rather philosopher Emil Tioran, with rather dark uh, dark philosophy. But uh, he has a nice uh, quote that one doesn't inhabit a country, but one inhabits a language. He says that is the country, that is the fatherland, and no other. And I find that as I grow uh, older, that more and more that uh, that comes to the fore. I agree with you that you know national uh, allegiances and and belongings are less crucial and complex. But um, but I think language is very much uh, a home. And uh, and I wonder, Kaya, what's your what's your what's your feeling on this? My life has been so much more simple because I grew up in Finland. I, I feel myself Finnish, if any, anything. I, I don't think about it that much, but uh, it's completely clear because I've lived uh, my life until adulthood in Finland that there are very much traditions and values uh, that are still in me. And even if I put them in question, they are really part of my personality because uh, I learned, started to learn in different languages only at school. Uh, it took me a really long time to learn French at all because when I came to Paris, I was working so much that uh, I didn't even meet anybody. So, so it's true that also people now, I've lived a long time in Paris and people say, uh, oh, your music is French, but the French people don't say it. They, they are the other people. And then, uh, but the French people could say, oh, she comes from the big North. 
she has this quality of big north so it's a little bit similar but uh, it's not relevant for me but i i know that i'm not a parisian woman i'm not a french woman i'm uh, i'm not a french person i I have become myself. I came to France because I really loved the, I, I felt, I found freedom in uh, Paris after my studies in Germany. And it took me a little bit time before I understood that uh, it's, it's very crazy jungle of bureaucracy in France, which is, much more complicated than it used to be in Germany. But uh, first I just felt the freedom. So uh, we lived in the United States uh, some years, every now and then. Uh, so in that sense, I felt myself uh, uh, in, a, in a way world citizen, but uh, but cosmopolitan, I'm so a private person that, uh, you know, I don't know. When I think about cosmopolitans, I think about them going to all the fantastic uh, parties around the world and, <laughs> and conquering uh, uh, different societies. That's, my life is not like that. Um. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I uh, remember Zoltan Kocsis, uh, the great Hungarian uh, musician, saying somewhere that he uh, felt that when he was outside of his uh, language for too long, so away from, from the Hungarian language sphere, that it would begin to affect his uh, music uh, phrasing and making and uh, that that language uh, and accentuation in language really um, made made a difference in his music making do you feel that uh, in in composing can you can you detect in yourself this uh, the uh, the Finnish language in the in in the way that your music is spaced in time for example and its intonation or do you think that's um, not that relevant Oh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I have, I don't know, but what do I do know is that uh, the reason that I've written so much uh, vocal music in French is that I've uh, lived so much in France. I mean, that's the language that I hear all the time. So in that sense, at least it has it has a connection with my uh, my work. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, perhaps the questions as we as we uh, wind down. A more general question to both of you, and I think one sensitive, especially from uh, from you, Alexi. Um, sort of the awareness of the. Uh, of the situation in society, in the world. Uh, you point to climate change, to uh, space race, to harmony or lack thereof between, between different uh, groups. Um, and of course, to you, Kai, same question. What do you think um, is our role, and your role, um, as artists, do you f and also do you think that art at this uh, stage in in human society has the potential to affect things, to to change things, or are we doing what we do just because we do it? Um, I know these are very big questions to ask, but obviously you um, you ponder them and you deal with them, so um, one wants to ask you about them. So maybe I'll link it first. I guess we, we all know that uh, um, empires have not fallen because a piece was played in one night. So we, we, we know that's not the, the way things are going to change through art, but 
think still, since things are so much about narrative and are so much about the points of view and the voices that are being represented, of course, there is a, something that can be done. And uh, if we bring it back to language, I mean, this this um, process that was called, uh, this aim that was called uh, debabilization by uh, Ezra Pound and this idea that we, we need to find ways to communicate between each other and uh, that means that we need a common language and at the same time we also need to be able to tr translate and learn what happens in different languages and different cultures and that's uh, this whole process of debabilization is a very complex one it requires a lot of efforts and I think that doing that is requires um, a lot an attention to the multiplicity of languages and flavors in, a, in order to be able to combine them or again to come back to this idea of harmony and the this other aspect that is not a fragmentation is on the opposite the monolingualism where the 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 monolingual reality that is uh, created in a in an imperialistic context is also very crushing and it prevents people from understanding each other uh, other than in a very degraded form because when when we were the monolingual culture it reduces everyone's vocabulary. So I think that in, in an artistic experience, we have the possibility to fight against this monolingual culture by displaying different points of view, by refragmenting reality. And this fragmented reality then to de uh, it uh, by recreating ways in which things circulate. And languages are a very good example of that, but they're just an example because I think any uh, artistic work that is interdisciplinary uh, that is intercultural also is doing this very same thing not necessarily in the semantic fabric of its work like we do in a multilingual work but is doing this very important work of just giving us different points of view uh different ways of approaching the same subject the same object it's even just having music and text is uh, in the same piece and having visuals, having different ways to approach the same object is training our very specific capacity to change our lenses as we observe something, to switch, to code switch, as we say in linguistics. This And this is a very, very important uh, skill in our, not just to survive in our world, which is of course the case, but just to transform it because uh, we need to be able to acknowledge complexity and acknowledge that there are multiple ways of seeing the same, the same object that are simultaneously true or simultaneously wrong, or maybe neither. And um, think and the, a work of art has that potential. It has the potential of shifting perspectives, of uh, enriching, enriching incredibly uh, the experience we have of the world and of each other. So in that sense, I think it is transformative. That's a very beautiful and compelling, compelling answer. Thank you. Yes, I, you know, there had never been human race as far as we know, human, humanity without music. And, uh, and I, I think human music is really uh, very, it can be so rich way of communicating. It's uh, uh, it is so deep. We can uh, process it intellectually, but uh, we process it also much more in depth that we don't even know about it ourselves. I think it's a big mystery, and uh, I think music should be. Uh, there also other among other cultures because that keeps us human uh, well what happens today is of course that uh, all this industry culture and uh, as you know yourself uh, also uh, our our work is now concerned of this industry and uh, we are treated as products and uh, we have our market value 
And uh, this is something extremely dangerous because, uh, you know, yes, yeah, some people know about my music, but uh, for the big guys, it's nothing. So I've, I feel that composers who compose my kind of music, we are really also in this list of uh, uh, disappearing species. Endangered species. <laughs> yes. And, and, uh, and I, uh, I feel very strongly about this. And uh, I feel uh, very strongly about human, uh, the future of human, uh, f humans and uh, the next generations who are being now born into this uh, unbelievably complicated world. And um, I'm worried about uh, uh, people using their skills of using their hands and uh, to do fine mechanics that one needs one, when one is a musician. And um, I think these are hugely important things. And uh, I want to believe that uh, by sharing our art, uh, it has some effect somewhere. Well, I, you both uh, speak uh, eloquently and, and very um, uh, authentically, I think. Uh, uh, about this important subject and um, like I said uh, having experienced uh, both your uh, your works uh, for example in the innocence and even in the snippets today of uh, reconnaissance that uh, I hope to hear live uh, soon and in Vista that I heard in uh, in, in in Helsinki I think um, it does have effect and um, serves also as a beautiful example of uh, of resisting as you said the industrialization of everything including including culture so um uh i hope you're not endangered species kaya but you are um you are both very very precious and uh and i hope that we will uh continue uh being the beneficiaries of, of the many fruits that, that both your creative uh, spirits uh, bring to us. On a selfish or personal note, I hope there'll be more piano music from you, Kaya, or possibly a piano <laughs> that, that I think lacks in your, in your output. But uh, for now, I wanted to, to thank both of you for taking this, um, this time to thank our participants and for the for the questions. I can't stress enough that uh, one should see Innocence, uh, the opera, and um, just that we, uh, we all keep listening and you keep writing. Thank so, you. Kiri. Thank you so much for, for, for being with us and I hope until next time soon. Yeah, thank Thanks. you for setting this up. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye bye.